It's a little tick of hers, you might say. I've dubbed it Shaking Hands with Stardust. With an approach that is as prone to melting your heart as it is to hardening it, Steinsgate's anime adaptation is impressive in that it rarely overplays anything. From a holistic perspective, it's a very balanced story in terms of presentation and execution, always doing what it needs to do and knowing how to use moderation. It can be hilarious and silly, but never overindulgent. It ponders the mechanics and theories of the plot, but never becomes a confusing lecture and maintains a natural and down-to-earth charm to keep things grounded. It's very emotional, but never overdramatic. It subtextually ponders free will and fate without preaching. It splices bits of darkness into the narrative during the lighter opening half, and bits of light in the darker second half to avoid habituation. Overall, it just does all the things it needs to to create the foundations of a finely tuned story, and from there the great writing and character work allow all of the huge moments and impactful story beats to drive everything home. But aside from the emotions pertaining to the characters, the connective tissue of all of these concepts, the element that allows them to strike deeply and hit with as much impact as they do, is the overlying yet understated tone of the series, a tone that captivated me nearly as much as the story itself did. Steinsgate, through its entire run, covers a barrage of styles. A pulsating sci-fi thriller, a philosophical pondering on the nature of time and destiny, an emotional romance, a slice-of-life comedy, a tragedy. But something that pervades this narrative a lot of the time throughout all of that is this intangible aura, melancholic and reflective. Like a feeling that something precious is consistently at risk of being lost even before the plot makes that more obvious, and that these silly and lighthearted moments that take up a great portion of the story need to be valued and cherished because of how easily they could slip away, whether it be due to death or lost memories. Somehow, even ignoring the foreshadowing and hints at how dangerous the time travel experiments were, this sort of thing is felt before the big shift at the end of episode 12, making that event one of inevitability and confirmation rather than something out of the blue. And aside from elements such as the masterful musical score, this is helped through the integration of rare, tiny sprinklings of heartfelt dialogue here and there. Strong enough to plant a seed in your subconscious and provide that feeling, yet subtle enough so that you may not even remember exactly what was said. And there is one character that captures this abstract feeling better than ever, with just a small little line. You know how we're having this conversation right now, Ogre? Yeah. Okay, so pretend that my brain goes back in time a whole week and they do the week over. What happens if we don't have this conversation the second time around? In that case, I assume you'd remember this talk, but not I. Because for me, the whole thing never would have taken place. So, I'd remember it just fine, but for you, it wouldn't exist at all. That's how it works? I think so. If that happened, I think that I would cry. <laughs> for me? For me, silly. In particular, there's a unique sort of pain attached to this idea. In this sort of situation, experience and knowledge and connections can feel like a curse, where times gone by of great value to you that enrich your memories are entirely void and lost to the others who have experienced them as well. The severity of this sort of pain can differ depending on the person, situation, and memory, but at best it's a bittersweet sense of isolation, at the very least. A sad sense of loneliness and loss. And this is one of the primary ideas that imbues Steinsgate with such a melancholic sentiment throughout. Initially, Okabe being the sole person who can remember these world line changes is seen as interesting and revelatory, and he's all too willing to continuously change things in the name of science and in order to help his friends in spite of the danger. And speaking personally, I was caught up in the intrigue of it all. The mystery, CERN, the mechanics of D-mails, how far these experiments could go, until Mayuri uttered that line. 
And then, I realized that this feeling was there from the beginning. I just wasn't able to quite understand what it was. It's a sad little sentiment that cuts through all of the excess and gets down to the heart of what really matters. In the end, is any of this really worth being subjected to so many alternate timelines where only you can remember all of the conversations you've had and all of the times that have been shared? Is that not too lonely to bear? As a man who has admitted to creating the future Gadgets Lab in order to make friends, who puts on a facade and act to mask his awkward yearning for affection, is Okabe not the exact type of person who isn't suited to bearing this burden? While he did feel this, he rarely ever pondered or confronted this sort of idea at this point in the story. Yet it's one of Mayuri's foremost thoughts. And I think this knack, this innate understanding, and this microcosm of this feeling are very indicative of the type of person who would say this. It's the sort of thing that speaks of Mayuri's deep, undeniable intuition and intelligence. She cannot even begin to grasp the science that Okabe, Kurisu, and Daru discuss for what seems like hours on end, but she's always there to support them, and most importantly, she just has this way of understanding who people are and how they're feeling, with a desire to keep everyone happy and healthy. She tries her best to make Moeka feel welcome, she can't stomach any conflict between Kurisu and Suzuha, she immediately catches on to the fact that Daru and Suzuha are connected in some way, and she's continuously able to sense Okabe drifting further and further away as he goes through the world lines fruitlessly trying to save her, feeling as if she's somehow at fault. It makes me feel really sad for him. You can tell he's trying not to cry, but he's having to fight back his tears so hard you can tell any second he's just going to lose it. Mayuri is the character furthest from book smart, but she is the one who sees things the clearest, feels her way towards the truth, and has her priorities straight the entire time. She's the one who instinctually reaches the furthest into the sky to find what truly matters. And even disregarding how wonderful of a person she is, and how much Okabe loves her, she needed to be saved in a thematic, symbolic way as well. Because if you don't have that genuine human element, that sense of what truly matters in life that Mayuri represents, what is even the point? A future without this heart and soul is a future that misses the forest for the trees, so while the two events are not directly connected, it is darkly a appropriate that the attractor field where her death is inevitable leads to a world completely devoid of most of what makes life worth living. Mayuri needed to be saved, otherwise everything would have been in vain, in more ways than one. And though she voices that with all of their new friends, Okabe doesn't really need her as a hostage anymore, she couldn't be more wrong. There is no one like Mayuri in the world, no one who understands the beauty of life and love and connection as much as her, and who lives their life in as much correspondence with that value. No one who can immediately understand the things that are important and at stake here. And no one that means more than him to her, and her to him. It's an idea that can be applied to the story on the whole as well. When it came right down to it, nothing really mattered to anyone as long as their loved ones were safe. We may get tangled up in peripheries and prideful habits and wild adventures, but in the end, when all is said and done, what we value most is simple home and hearth, affection and love. And the beautiful thing is that it was Okabe who helped Mayuri see this and reach this place of understanding. After declaring her to be his hostage, he prevented her from being metaphorically sucked into the sky due to the grief of her grandmother's death. He prevented her from being lost forever. And this helped her realize that she was loved and valued, and that the connections she forms in her life and the well-being of those she loves are of utmost importance. The two continuously find themselves saving one another, and it's quite a lovely thing. Okay. Better stay then. Since I'm your hostage and all. You're gonna have to wait for me. Okay, Grammy?
Mayuri is invaluable because she's infectiously heartfelt and endearing, endlessly compassionate, consistently supportive and empathetic, and able to see things clearer than anyone else in the story. And all of this is pretty obvious right from the start, but more impactful in retrospect because it really helps explain the origin of that sad and melancholic tone I mentioned. Appropriately for someone who just intuitively saw the truths of the world in a way exclusive to her, after initially being proud of the accomplishment, Mayuri was never totally comfortable with the time machine once she realized the unsettling risks involved with genuine human time travel. She never could have predicted the specifics, but once the potential consequences and changes were made known to her, she immediately gave her reservations. She supported everyone with a smile, but behind that, something always just felt off with the experiments once they moved into genuinely serious territory. And that probably should have been the biggest red flag to Okabe. This sounds weird, but I get the impression Mayuri's more relieved than all of us. Maybe you're right. I think out of the group she had the keenest focus on the big picture. We couldn't see the forest for the trees. Knowing the type of person she is, it follows logically that Mayuri would be overjoyed at the idea of being rid of the time machine, this figment of unknown danger, and going public with the findings. And concurrently, the reason that I think the show established that strangely sad tone early on is because from the minute Okabe accidentally sent the first email, he took his first step on the road to losing that which he held most dear. And it isn't something that we as the audience could ever have understood the ramifications of in that moment, but the anime helps us feel, in an abstract way, what Mayuri can sense later on. Through presentation, the show helps us get a subconscious inkling of the type of trepidation Mayuri felt, those very specific vibes. Like something isn't quite right, like although we may not know why, there is something afoot that feels deeply sorrowful, deeply lonely. And her decision to once again use her intuition, despite not fully understanding the situation, to slap some sense into Okabe and force him to realize that he can save Kurisu is a huge part of what finally dissipates that sadness. Steinsgate is without a doubt the story and study of Okabe. Not to disregard the monumental role of Kurisu, of course, nor the importance of Suzuha's trials. But whenever I think of the feeling of the series, the tonal identity, my mind can't help but land on Sheena Mayuri. I feel as though the structure of the series centers around her, that the tone and soundtrack often reflect her state of mind, and that the story's messages about connection are representative of everything she had in her heart from the start. Mayuri is a big part of why everything in this story ticks. She's absolutely essential to everything that Steinsgate does, and she remains one of the best, most important, and most iconic anime characters of all time for good reason. Because in a story that gets caught up in cold calculation at times, she's always there to bring things back to a warm and heartfelt center, always able to prioritize life and love. And that is something that cannot be valued enough. Many thanks for watching.